Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Fed Life Podcast. I am your host, Dan Seip. Additionally, I'm the branch manager here at Serving Those Who Serve and Lee Seip and Associates. And I want to begin, as I always do, by saying thank you for your service. You do not hear that enough. You will always hear it here. And I will also thank you for taking the time to listen to us. Uh, Ed Zerndorfer is back with us again today. The guru is here as part of our ongoing mission to reach, teach, and serve you. And at the outset, I need to say that the opinions of our guest Ed Zerndorfer are not the opinions of Raymond James or Serving This Serve. This podcast is presented for information only and should not be taken as advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors before taking any action. And if you do not have a personal advisor, hit us up at stwserve.com. We will help you any way we can. Once again, we will be following Ed's Fed Zone articles. But wait. There's one more way to learn from Ed and the crew, and that is the weekly serving. Every week, we deliver the best of Ed, Jennifer Meyer, Ed's webinar partner, Benefits Ben, right to your inbox. So don't miss out. See the subscription information on this YouTube page for the podcast. Now, if you're a regular listener, you know that September is Life Insurance Awareness Month. And in keeping with that, Ed turns his focus to that topic. So Ed, we've got three articles to talk through in our in our two podcasts. So let's take them in order. First up is federal employees and retirements or retirees insurance needs and choices. And you open with a really interesting stat that 70% of Americans say they need life insurance, but you feel most folks don't understand it. Uh, that is correct, Dan. Um, I also, also want to say, Dan, um, I want to welcome all the all you and our listeners to Life Insurance Awareness Month. Indeed. The month of uh, September was uh, is, has been designated as Life Insurance Awareness Month. It's been going on now for about almost 20 years. Um, an industry ins- education group called Life Happens designated this month back in 2004 to help Americans understand what life insurance is and how it can really provide financial security for their families. So that's, w- that's what drove me to write these three columns um, in the Fed zone during the month of September to make federal employees and their families aware of life insurance. Um, in terms of what life insurance is, it's a contract, a legal contract between an insurance company, let's call that the insurer, and mm-hmm. an individual who applies for the life insurance and is approved. Now, when I say a contract, as you know, Dan, there are two sides to a contract, mm-hmm. two sides, two parties. Um, in this case here, one party is the individual who applies and is approved for life insurance. Yep. And that person only has one obligation under the contract to pay the premiums. If they don't yep. pay the premiums, mm-hmm. they lose the contract. Yep. On the other side is the insurance company. And what is the, what is the uh, legal, um, what is the insurance company legally supposed to do as part of the contract? If, if God forbid the, insured the person who applied for life insurance and was approved dies the insurance company must pay out the life insurance proceeds which is nothing more than the face amount of the life insurance policy that the, that the insured was approved for so it sure. is a contract it is a, it's it's a what's called a bilateral contract in which there are two sides sure and uh as you correctly identify the company has all of the enforceable promises uh, it's important to understand that just because somebody has entered into it and is paying premiums, they are not forced to continue. But if they do, the company is on the hook for all of the provisions of that contract. So that's that's great answer, Ed. And it's a nice segue into laying out the two basic types of life insurance that you cover in your article, which would be term and permanent. So uh, let's walk us through the four types that you cover in that article. Well, we're talking about the four types of term life insurance. Correct. Let just, let's just break down what term life insurance versus permanent life insurance is. Term mm-hmm. life insurance, as the as the term as the name sort of 
hints to it ha is a life insurance policy that is um, applicable only for a certain number of years, 10 mm -hmm. years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe as many as 40 years. On the other hand, permanent life insurance, also known as cash value life insurance, is for a lifetime. Person mm -hmm. applies for is approved for a permanent uh, life insurance policy. I'll give you an example, Dan. Uh, whole life insurance, universal sure. life insurance, variable life insurance. If we have time, we'll talk in more detail about those types of life insurance. But the point is, when the person applies for those insurances at whatever age, their 20s, 30s, and 40s, as long as they, and they're approved, as long as they pay the premiums, those policies will last for a lifetime. Term yep. insurance is going to end at the end of the term. Yep. Now, now um, term life insurance is, can be broken down to four types. One mm -hmm. is called decreasing term life insurance, in which the while the insurance policy is in force and the insured is paying the premiums, the amount of the life insurance is going to decrease from one year to the next. Now, why would somebody want to buy such a pro, su such a type of life insurance policy in which the the face amount of the policy is is decreasing as the in, as the insured gets older? and pays the premiums. The, for example, let's say the individual bought a house, takes on a mortgage. And as you know, when you take on a mortgage, you're paying, the, you're paying your mortgage payment monthly. In the early years of that mortgage, most of your monthly payment is for interest, is for interest. Um, and a little bit is for the, um, the paying down the mortgage principal. In the later years of the mortgage, um, less is paid in interest and more is paid um, it, it, in terms of the mortgage principal, uh, it, you're, you're paying it down. Sure. Um, so the idea is being this, that somebody only wants to have enough life insurance to cover the balance on their mortgage. Mm -hmm. The only reason they're buying this life insurance is to pay off this big debt in the event they die. Because let's keep in mind, Dan, that if you have a mortgage on your house and you pass away, the, that mortgage balance is not going to be forgiven. It has to be paid off. Oh, yeah. So who would pay it off? Well, let's say a relative, children inherit the house. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to uh, either pay off the balance of the mortgage or sell the house. Hopefully, it's going to sell, uh, sell for more than the more what's left on the mortgage. And that way, the mortgage will be paid off. So the individual does not want to be in that position. They want to make sure that if they were to die, there's going to be enough life insurance to pay off the balance of the mortgage. It's called sure. decreasing term life insurance. Yep. It's not that popular, but it is around. Sure. The next type of life insurance, uh, term life insurance is called convertible term life insurance. Allows the policy holder to convert a term life insurance policy to a permanent life insurance policy. Now, Dan, this is something that has, should, be note, this should be noted, that when you go out and buy a life insurance policy, you have to be approved. The insurance company is going to look at your medical records. You may have to go through a medical exam. They may check other things like your driving record because they mm -hmm. the insurance company wants to make sure that you are insurable. insurable. But if someone, let's say, um, has been approved for their term for a term life insurance policy and they decide, well, that policy is not for them. They feel that they're going to need um, life insurance for a longer period of time than, than the term of that policy. Sure. The insurance company may may allow the um, and not all insurance companies allow this to convert that term life insurance policy to a a uh, a permanent cash value life insurance policy. It's most likely going to be a whole life policy. Mm -hmm. But the key, Dan, is the fact that that person who might be, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years older than when they bought their original term policy. Um, does not have to furnish evidence of insurability. They're old. Very true. They may Very not true. be insurable. They may have developed a, a, a condition that may negate their chances to get a life insurance policy. Well, not in this case. The insurance mm -hmm. company says, um, we will insure you. You buy this whole life policy, whole life insurance policy. You convert your term life to whole life. You do, you're, you're in. It's guaranteed issue. But gotcha. that's going to come with a price. I mean, that sure. literally. That person's sure. going to pay a, a lot more in premiums for that right. So Very that's true. called convertible term life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. um, another type of 
um, ter term life insurance policy is annual renewable. Mm -hmm. Annual renewable term or ART for short. What is that? Um, and, and an individual purchases a life insurance policy, um, let's say when they're young, in their 20s and 30s. And the premiums look really attractive. They really look like what they see. And they, they say to the insurance company, I'm going to apply for a $500,000 ART policy. And the person applies, is approved, and lo and behold, the premium that they are uh, hoping to get, they got. Well, with, AR, with ART insurance, uh, life insurance, the insurance company reserves the right to increase those premiums from year to year. Yep. The, the insurer, the person who bought the policy, the policy owner and the insurer, does not have to provide evidence of insurability in order to continue the policy from year to year. But as you know, when we get older, Dan, we get closer to that ultimate moment where we're not going to, we're not going to, we're going to die. Don't and remind me, Ed. <laughs> and the insurance company knows that, that this person now is going to be more of a risk, risk to sure. die. Yep. A risk of dying, which is going to be mean more of a risk to the insurance company. And what is the insurance company going to do? They're going to increase their premiums. Sure. Increase their in premiums from year to year. But the, no. the good news is that the person will keep their insurance, even if their health deteriorates, the insurance sure. company will not kick them out. Gotcha. And, and let's round it out with level term. Oh, my favorite type of insurance, Dan. <laughs> I just want to mention to you and to the audience, I have an insurance license. Uh, be honest with you, I do not sell life insurance. I don't have time but I am also a charter life underwriter, which is a designation given by the American College up in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. It's part of the, it's part of, um, the University of Pennsylvania, um, um, Wharton, the Wharton School. And uh, I got that designation about 20 years ago, which essentially what it means is you, you have to pass a series of 20, uh, 10 exams in, in, in insurance. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, not a, it's not that easy to get, but I did manage to get it. And as role well is, I, I'm, a, I'm able to really get into insurance, understand how insurance works and premium, how premiums are determined, things like that. So sure. I have a lot of details in my mind about life insurance. Now, the reason I like level term insurance is the fact that when you um, buy a level term life insurance, when I say term, you could buy a level term life insurance policy um, for a 10 year period, for a 15 year period, for a 20 year period, 20, uh, 25, 30. I understand now some companies are offering 40 year level term policy. Now, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Okay. So you apply for a level, let's say a 20 year level term policy. And let's say you're applying for a $500,000 um, 20 year level term life insurance policy. You're approved, which means the following. You're going to pay the same premiums for all 20 years that um, that you did the same premium you pay in year one. You're going to pay in year 20. Mm -hmm. your, 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 your premium costs do not go up from year to year, and the face amount of the policy stays the same. This is unlike decreasing term in which you are paying the same premium from year to year, but the face amount of your policy um, um, will go down. With level gotcha. term. Everything stays the same. Why do I like this? Because it gives you that assurance that later on, let's say maybe um, you retire and your income is less, you don't have to worry that you're that you're gonna have to pay more in life insurance. Typically, when you retired, um, you're, you're you don't have as much income coming in as you did when you were working, so you have, may have to cut your expenses. Well, you don't have to worry about cutting your life insurance expenses your life insurance, although it's costing for life insurance, but you're because you're going to be paying the same premium, the same premium for all, for all, um, the, for all the term, the life of the, or the term of the policy, again, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, or four, as much as 40 years. Do you have to gotcha. keep it for the whole time? No, you can drop it anytime you want, but once you drop it, no more life insurance. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, a, a great, so, summary and flyover all of those the one thing that i will drop in and this is just from working with it you know pretty much on the on on a weekly basis at the very least 
the convertible aspect is now available in various types of terms. So you can, when you're talking with your insurance agent and he's talking to you or she's talking to you about a level premium term, you can also ask, is this convertible? Uh, some will be, some will not. And, uh, and you'd be surprised nowadays how economical it is to maintain a convertibility feature. And the, the reason I bring this up is I encourage people to have a plan for how they're going to use their risk management or insurance, but also to hold that loosely because before the podcast we were talking, and I know a gentleman who in his 70s became guardians for his two twin grandsons who are special needs. So he's going to have a very different uh, risk profile at that age than he probably anticipated when he was 45 or 50. And by virtue of being able to con convert term policies and things like that, he has options he might not otherwise have. So I think that was uh, worth chatting about a little bit. All right, Ed, let's pivot and talk about the 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 permanent life insurance. And you have you have three examples there. So tell us about those. Okay, once again, Dan, a permanent or sometimes called a cash value life insurance policy stays in force for the insured's life, provided again that the policyholder does not stop paying the premiums or surrenders the policy. Um, with with cash value life insurance pol policies, because they build up cash value, which some individuals do, they own the policy for any number of years, and they build up some cash value. So they want to surrender the policy in order to get to the cash value. Well, I just right. want to mention that's going to have some tax consequences, which I'm not going to get into. But sure. before you do such a thing, please talk to your your tax advisor before you start surrendering surrendering your cash value life insurance policy. Um, I, I hate with my clients when they say, "Oh, by the way, uh, last when I occur in tax season." Oh, by the way, um, I, f I forgot to tell you last year I got rid of my I I, I surrendered my um, my my uh, universal life insurance policy, which I've um, which um, I uh, held for about about thirty years. And Ed, you would not you're not going to believe the amount of money I made by surrendering that policy. All that oh, yeah. was paid to me. And I said. Yep. You did that without asking me. Well, I didn't. I didn't want to bother you. Mm. Now you're going to bother me. This right. person. This person has happened this past this past tax season. This person's 48 years old. When he surrendered the policy, he made um, he got a cash payout of about um, forty thousand dollars. Forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That subject Dan to federal income tax. Yep. To state income tax, and yep. because the person's under age 59 and a half a 10% early withdrawal penalty. Ouch. Ouch is right. He lost about a half of it after taxes. And Ouch. That's why that's, that's what bothers me. Sure. All right. So here are the types I, I talk about in the, in the fed zone column, mm -hmm. um, whole life insurance. It's a life insurance policy that accumulates cash value, a portion of the insurance premium. What happens is that the person who owns this policy is paying a little extra in premiums compared to, let's say, um, a term policy, sure. because that extra premium is deposited in, in a cash account and earns interest. Not much interest, but it gets some interest. And the advantage of that is the accumulated cash value insurance allows the policyholder to use the cash value for, any, for many purposes, such mm -hmm. as a, a taking out a loan yep, or... Um, or to pay policy premiums. They actually can 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 make the election to uh, tell the insurance company, don't give me a dividend or don't give me any, don't give me any interest. Use that money to help pay the policy premiums. Sure. Then there's universal life insurance policy, which is, uh, which started back in the 1980s when interest rates were high. It basically- Oh, I remember. <laughs> remember those days? Oh yeah. When the interest rates were, um, um, 12%, like, uh, 12, 12, 15%, things like yep. that. And the insurance companies pounce on us saying, listen, we can really take advantage of this. We're going to offer a life insurance policy that offers a death benefit and, and a cash value in which we're not going to pay that measly amount of interest that, that that's paid in a whole life policy. We're talking about, let's take advantage of all these great market rates, 12, 15%. Sure. And not only that, Dan, we're going to allow um, the policy owner um, with this universal life policy to put on to, to deposit money into the policy yep. and let them and let them build up more and more cash value. Well, 
That was very popular when interest rates were 15 to 20, 12, 15 percent. Well, what happened to interest rates, Dan? They went down, Ed. They went down and yep. a lot down. And a lot down. They got the shock, shock of their life. Some people. Yeah, they were looking life. at them at 3% yeah, <laughs> instead <three>. of 12. <laughs> so, um, and then the, the, then the insurance companies got a little fancy when interest rates went down. They started indexing. Yep. The, the 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 interest that they're paying based on the on the stock market performance they index the in, they index the the interest rate to various stock indices like the S and P five hundred they got very creative sure. very creative and finally the other type of um, cash value policy I talk about is a variable um, variable life insurance in which the policyholder, the one who, bought, who who buys this policy, can take the extra premium dollars and invest it in the stock market, in stocks and, and stocks. And uh, when the stock market was doing good, some people made some money on it. When the stock market was not doing so good, they lost money in this policy. Very true. And then they, the insurance companies got very creative and they combined the variable and the universal life policy to come up with something called VUL, Variable yep. Universal Life Insurance Policies. And I don't know if you're getting questions about this, uh, Dan, <laughs> but boy, yeah. I get I get clients galore. They ask me, oh, I, uh, I know I'm here to do my taxes. But I would just ask you a quick question. What is your opinion of um, these um these 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 insurance policies that offer cash value, like index universal life or variable universal life or index variable universal life, all this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what I tell them, Dan? I I, I tell them I have a very simple, very simple um, re, a, a, a reaction to their question. A very simple answer to their question. It depends. No, I say. No. It's from, I have a philosophy when it comes to my own investments. When I when I invest my money. And I want to pass that on to you. And my philosophy is this, if you don't understand fully Ooh, yeah. yep. what you're not, what you're about to buy, it could be any type of investment. It could be uh index universal life insurance, it could be um it could be exchange traded funds, mm -hmm. anything, any exotic I call exotic out of the ordinary investments. If you don't understand what you're about to buy, don't buy it and good please, advice never be sold on anything don't let anybody whether it's your financial planner your insurance person whoever try to convince you this is the best thing for you usually it's the best thing for the person selling it because they get a huge commission that's 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 been that's my reaction sure so if you don't understand it don't buy it that's my philosophy Absolutely. Now, if you ask me about term life insurance, I'll tell you everything you need to know and recommend for most people, term life insurance is the best way to go because because like, life insurance, like any other financial asset, has to have a purpose. And most people, that purpose is going to be to pay a death benefit, to pay off a big debt. And I say pay a death benefit for the sake of income protection for family members. It yep. has to have a reason. Sure. Or another example would be to pay a state settlement costs, pay for your funeral. I can see that, but it's under it's very understandable term what it what it does. It's paying strictly a death benefit. Now, when it comes to cash value life insurance policy, there may be a reason you may want to buy it. I'm sure there is, but you got to be very clear what that reason is, and that will determine if it is appropriate whether it's suitable for you to buy such a policy. Sure. You know, and Ed, that's kind of a segue into the next part of your article, which is the, the type of insurance or how much life insurance to buy. And uh, you, you indicate that, that before you get to the decision of, of applying for anything, that, that you should, you know, analyze your financial situation. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, um, you, you have to sit down, you have to sit down. And if you can't do this, let's say you are working with a life insurance professional, an insurance broker, an insurance agent who's licensed to sell life insurance. Before you start 
you know, determine before you say, well, I need X number of, of, of X number of dollars of life insurance, sit down with that person and go over your finances and determine such things as, and ask the question, if I were to die, I'm working now. And if I were to die and I have a family, what is going to happen to my family when I'm not around, when that paycheck is not around? I'm sure, sure. That's, that, that's been said before. Um, I have all this debt. I got a mortgage. I have maybe a car loans. I have a home equity loan, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Will my family be able to pay those loans, the, 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 those loans, if I were to pass away? Sure. Um, now, I'll give you another example here where someone may not be getting a paycheck. And I, 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 I cannot tell you how important this is. Um, and to explain what I'm talking about here, I want to relate a true story. When okay. I, at the time I was, I was selling life insurance. Um, I would, I would, someone would ask me if I, if they could, if I could help them get some life insurance policy. So this happened, Dan, probably about, about 20 years ago, I got a phone call from, um, a federal employee, he had, he hmm. had attended one of my seminars at that time. And he said, Ed, um, I'd like if possible to meet with you because I think I'm going to need some, some life insurance. I have the hmm. government life insurance, but I don't think it's enough. We just yeah. bought a house. I said, I'll tell you what, i will be more than happy. I'll come out to your home and, um, we'll sit down and we'll go over all your finances, everything you need. So I went out to his home, sat down with him. He's about 27 years old, just took on a mortgage, and we were going over his needs. And as I'm talking to him, Dan, his wife, probably about 24 years old, is running around the house chasing a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So his mm -hmm. first name is Jim. I'm going to use Jim. Okay. I said, Jim, I think we're about to determine how much you need, but your wife, Carol, how much life insurance is she going to need? And he says to me, oh, she doesn't need any she doesn't need any life insurance. She's not working. I say, excuse me? Mm. She's not working. I said, Jim, you cannot put a dollar value on the worth of a stay-at-home dad or mom. I'm sorry. What were to happen if Carol, God forbid, were to pass away? Who's going to take care of those kids? You're going to have to hire a full-time nanny almost take care of the kids, take care of your house while you're working, all those type of things. You know what the bottom line is, Dan? We got, we end up, I think I ended up getting him a $500,000 life insurance policy and getting getting Carol a $300,000 life insurance policy for 30 sure. years. Sure. 30 years. So that, that, that there's some, there's some mis, misunderst misunderstandings there, misunderstandings. And, some of the other reasons when we go over finances saying, well, how much you know, the, the debt, do you, have, do you have enough, have enough liquidity to pay mm -hmm. for, um, let's say a funeral, a state settlement costs, things like that. So this is a determining factor. What I generally recommend if people want, if, if, if let's say federal employees want to go out and get life insurance before they do that, that they, take advantage of some of the very good calculators out there. Calculator. Sure. Um, I have listed in the article and I'll say it very slowly here, what that, what that website is. It's it. Um, and, and, and the calculator it's found on a website called bank rate bank rate. That's B A N K R A T E.com bank rate.com. And if you go to that website and just click on insurance, mm -hmm. the calculator will pop up. If you want to know the full the full website, my my Fed Zone column it's dated yep. uh, the first one in September. I think it was September the sixth. I think it was September the sixth. Yep, uh, got it right here. Okay, has the full website. And please, before you go out and buy any life insurance, use that calculator to give you an idea how much you're going to need. Very important. Okay, you don't want to end up being underinsured. Sure. You don't want to end up being overinsured. It's possible. You could overinsure yourself. You don't want that. No, it makes sense. And you have a really, really interesting uh, and, and important uh, paragraph to close it at where you talk about 
people considering replacing existing coverage. Uh, why don't you uh, why don't you touch briefly on on your warning there? Yes, um, that um, the the one warning is before you get rid of one life insurance policy. Okay, mm -hmm. do not. Uh, before you, you, if you, if you're going to apply for a new life insurance policy, do not get rid of your current life insurance policy until you've been approved and the new policy is in force. Yes. Is in force. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, great thoughts, Ed. And, and to close it out, I, I would just like to add, you know, because I've been elbows deep in this for 35 years, no amount of money can replace a loved one. It just can't. So in, in our planning, what we like to focus on is what is needed to keep the family in their world and continue on to their futures. Because we don't want a situation where, where a child loses a parent and a way of life at, at the same time. So, so keep that in mind, folks. Uh, Ed, let's, let's move to that second article, which is Federal Employee Choices for Life Insurance. And you begin with Fegley the Federal Employee Group Life Insurance. And this is really the home cooking for our feds. Uh, it's, it's a group term life plan that can allow a brand new employee to enroll in over six times their salary in a life insurance benefit. So your, your article comes at it from a high level and you begin with the advantages and disadvantages as, as you see them. So for advantages, uh, you, you talk about guaranteed issue level premiums. Walk us through that. Okay, Dan. Um, we were talking earlier about uh, different types of individual life insurance policies. We were talking about the fact that uh, we're about we were talking about term and permanent or cash value. Let's keep in mind that when a person applies for those those individual policies, they have to be approved. Sure. Approved. There's no guarantee they're going to be approved. Right. Nor is it's guaranteed that the, that the premium they like to pay, they're going to get, they have to, they're going to be rated based on their, on what's called underwriting. The other type of insu life insurance plan is called a group sponsored policy. Mm -hmm. In this case here, the group who's sponsoring the life insurance is the federal government. The federal government allows permanent full-time and part-time employees when they are hired to enroll in the Federal Employees Group Life Insurance Program, mm -hmm. in which there are different parts, but let me just say this. When an employee is hired, they are automatically enrolled in what is called the Fagley Basic Insurance Amount, the BIA. What is the basic insurance amount? It is an employee's SF-50 you have an SF-50, there's a salary on there. Mm -hmm. It's going to be their SF-50 salary adjusted a little bit upward to the next $2,000. Mm -hmm. And as their SF-50 SF fifty salary goes up, so does so does the amount of their Fagley basic insurance amount. Mm -hmm. They pay the premiums for their Fagley basic via payroll deduction. Every two weeks, they're paying two thirds of the premium costs and the agency is paying the other one third. Now, what yep. is the advantage of this? What is the advantage? There is no underwriting, Dan. There's right. no, you, they, the, the, that uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company who runs the Fagley program is not gonna mm -hmm. check your medical records. They're not gonna check if you're a smoker or a non-smoker. They're not going to. They're not going to. They're not going to put you through a medical exam. You are guaranteed issue. The premiums that you pay for the basic, the basic insurance amount. That, well, I, I shorten it to the BIA. Do not depend on your age. A twenty-five-year-old mm -hmm. employee, federal employee, pays the same premium, the same amount, the cost per thousand dollars of coverage, the same dollar amount per thousand dollars of coverage as an 85-year-old employee. Sure. Ditto for a smoker versus a non-smoker. Okay. So there's a lot of there's a lot of advantages to, of advantages to this. Um mainly that some people who come to the government may not be insurable. Insurable. Um, sure. 
And in addition to the Fegley basic insurance amount, when the employee is hired, they have the option of enrolling in what's called the optional coverages. Option A, which is a, it's called standard. It's yep. a flat $10,000. Yep. Option B is multiple of salary. Mm -hmm. What salary? Your SF50 salary adjusted upward to the next $1,000. And you can mm -hmm. get one, two, three, four, or five multiples of that. And option C, which is family coverage. Whose family? A spouse and children under the age of 22. Once yep. again, there is no underwriting. Sure. You're in. You are guaranteed coverage when you enroll. When you were first hired, you will have 60 days, 60 days to enroll in the optional coverages without going through underwriting. If you don't enroll within the 60 days, then you're not going to get it unless you um, enroll, unless you're there's an open season for Fagley, which rarely occurs, or you have a life event. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, you know, people are are familiar with these options out there, but a lot of times we find that the time they spend with us and and we're sort of explaining the the, the different parts, uh, it's it's really the first time that somebody's ever sat with them and told them how the things work. So let's use a little bit of our time here. So you mentioned that that you've got within the options the A, B, and C. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about it and and give us a rundown of of option A. Because we know it's we know it's a flat amount of ten thousand dollars. I'm a geek for this, Ed. So I know a little bit of the story behind uh, behind yeah, so option I, I, I I like Dan if you if you could t tell that story because um, it really makes a good point. I know what story you're referring to, and I I think I think it's a really we help uh, help our the listeners to, to hear this story because it make, it makes a very good point. Well, specifically with option A, people go, eh, why is it ten thousand? And folks, you need to remember that this, this group insurance plan has been around since 1956. And there's at least one person on this podcast who's been around since 1956 for sure. And, and I know because that was my birth year. <laughs> and so, so it's been around for a while. And if we go back and we look at what average salaries were back then, they were like $35 and $4,200 a year. So option A would cover a home mortgage back then. So that's that's one of the reasons. It's it's a little bit of an anachronism for the system, but it's still there. So Ed, why don't you tell us the rest about it? You know, it has, you know, cost changes every five years, of course. So walk us through that. Uh, yes, the, the, the employees, employees who are enrolled in the optional coverage is all of them pay the full cost of premiums. So there's no agency contribution for that. Mm -hmm. And option A, option A, the flat $10,000 stays that amount, but the monthly premiums or biweekly premiums that one pays will go up um, every five years, every five mm -hmm. years, like, there's a five-year window goes up like um, 30 to under 30. Third, between 30 to 35, 35 yep. to 40, all the way up um, through uh, age, whatever age an employee retires. Let me just say this, that um, when an employee turns, I think, age 60, we're still working, the monthly cost stays at $13 a month. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the same. same. But Dan, what really goes up in costs as the employee ages is option B. As yep, here we go. That's the multiple of one salary. Yep. And take your SF50 salary and round it up to the next $1,000. So let's say an employee has an SF50 salary of, oh, let's say $104,000. Mm -hmm. Round 104500 right? Then round it up to the next thousand is 105000 So the employee yep. could get one times that, one hundred five thousand, two hundred and five thousand, two times one hundred and five, three, four, or five times one hundred and five thousand would be their total coverage for option B. Yep. Here's the problem: option B gets super expensive. It does by the time an employee reaches age fifty-five. Very true. Very true. You know, case in point, folks, and we won't belabor this, but if you're under thirty-five, you know, option B is 
two cents per thousand biweekly. By the time you're 50, it's 20 cents. So you can sort of get a feel for that. So that's going to that's gonna be going up. Now, it talks a little bit at option C because uh, that's multiples, but they're a little bit different. It's not based on salary. Yes. Uh, option C, option C is following. A employee can, um, has the option of enrolling a spouse. Mm -hmm. um, the spouse um, would get coverage of one, two, three, four, or five time multiples of $5,000. So you could choose to have your spouse enrolled for $5,000 10,000, 15, uh, uh, 10, 15,000, 20,000, a maximum of 25,000. That's five mm -hmm. times 5,000. And if the employee has children under the age of 22, the employee has the option of insuring their children one, two, three, four, or five time multiples of $2,500. Gotcha. So if the spouse has, let's say, $25,000 of coverage, and let's say the, the, the individual, the employee has three children, all in the age of 22, then each child could be insured up to um, 20, um, 20 um, I'm sorry, $12,500. That's five mm -hmm. times 2,500. Now, what is the employee paying? What is their premiums based on? Their the number of multiples that they're insuring a family for. So in my example here, five multiples in the spouse and three and five multiples for three children, three children, that's 15. That's a total of 20 multiples. What they're paying per thousand per, per what they're paying for here, Dan, is each multiple, a gotcha. certain dollar amount per multiple per amount per, per month. And as the employee gets older, gets older, so does the, the cost of the multiples. Sure. Now, to give you an idea how some, some employees may not be aware, particularly when it comes to the costs for um, the children, children are only going to be insured until they're 22. Gotcha. When they turn 22, they are no longer insured under option C mm -hmm. spouse stays on spouse right. stays on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by the way, Dan, when it comes to the cost, these multiples, you know, whose age is it based on who the employees like, pays the spouse. Yep. If you have a younger spouse. Would you pay less in premiums? Yes, nope. you would. No, you won't. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I answered employee. for the private sector. Sorry. <laughs> it's based on the employee's age. Yes, very true. Not, not the, it's And for children, the same thing is true. Right. Here, you are, let's say, uh, 40 years old, and you got three children, you know, all in the age of tw under the age of 22. Okay. You're, it's based on your age, 40. Gotcha. All right. Um, now, when a child turns 22, they are no longer insured. Now, I want to relate a story to you. True story. I was doing a seminar. This happened probably about, about six, six, six years ago. I was out of town. And a gentleman sitting in the back of the room, I was explaining about option C. Mm -hmm. And he, he shake, he's just scratching his head. I can see he was looking. He said, he came up to me during a break and said, you mean to tell me my two sons are no longer enrolled in option C? I said, how old are your sons? 48 and 42. <laughs> I said, yep. nope, they've been realize, off for a while. You've been paying those option C, multi the, the, the cost for those for how much coverage? Oh, we ha I have five multiples on each. That's 10 multiples. And how old are you? He said, oh, I'm about 74 years old. <laughs> You don't want to know the cost. He said, I've been overpaying for the past 20, you know, in the case of the younger son for 22 years and the older son, 28 years. What do I do? I said, you have to get rid of it. You have to take those two sons off of there. How do I do yep. that? I gave him the form number. But you know something? If he wouldn't have been at that webinar, uh, that, I'm sorry, that seminar, he would have continued to pay those premiums. The sure. What I'm saying is, 
the office of Fagley does not send a notice to uh, those federal employees who are, old, who are enrolled in option C with children when the child turns 22 to notify them, please remove your child from coverage. They just keep paying the premiums. Now, makes, now that makes sense, Ed, because, you know, they, they wouldn't have the facility to keep track of every dependent's birth date. Well, you know, you know, something, you know something, you know something, Dan, that's not the case when it comes to the federal employee health insurance. True. When a child turns 26, they're going to get a notice. Your child is now 26. Get them off of there. Sure. Um, so the gentleman said, will they refund me the premiums? I said, they have to. They have to refund those premiums to you. Gotcha. And once you paid all those years when your sons were no longer insured. And then he said, what would they, what would happen if God forbid they died? I said, they would just, they would just give you a refund of the premiums. That's it. Cause sure. they are not insured. Sure. Well, awesome, Ed. You know, I think this is a good place for us to break uh, because we'll be talking, uh, talking more in our next podcast. We're going to do our best to demystify private life insurance. So I think this is a, a good pausing point. Uh, Ed, once again, don't know how you do it, but, but I thank you for what you do for us in the federal community, especially for what you help us learn as a team. You know, that's awesome. We're very grateful for you to that, to you for that. Uh, well, folks, that is a wrap. We are serving those who serve. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on YouTube channel and Spotify. Please remember to share it with friends and strangers. Check us out on Twitter and LinkedIn. And don't forget our live webinars every week. Uh, head to the SWS website at swserve.com and you'll see the webinar button. Click it and it'll take you to the webinar landing page. There's a whole suite there. The guru comes to you, reach you where you are, teach you where you are, serve you where you are. Sign up for one, sign up for all, and share that page with your friends. They will thank you. Be sure to read Ed every week in the Fed Zone at fed-zone.com. And don't forget to sign up for the weekly serving. Ed and all the other Fed stars from SWS coming straight to you. So for Ed, the crew at Serving Those to Serve, and me, Dan Seip, good luck, Godspeed, and above all, remember, it's your Fed life. Make it a great one because you deserve it. Stay well, everybody. We are out. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services. Raymond James is not affiliated and does not endorse the opinions or services of any of the quoted professionals or their respective firms. Any opinions are those of Dan Seip and not necessarily those of RJFS or Raymond James. This case study is for illustrative purposes only. Individual cases will vary. Raymond James is not affiliated with and does not endorse the opinions or services of the quoted professionals or their respective organizations. Neither Raymond James Financial Services nor any Raymond James Financial Advisor renders advice on tax issues. These matters should be discussed with the appropriate professional. Investing involves risk and you may incur a profit or loss regardless of strategy selected, including diversification and asset allocation.